Hey there, folks. I just want to apologize for my schedule being kind of a little whack. Uh, I didn't get a video out last week. Things are a bit crazy right now. Uh, my wife and I are preparing our house to sell it, and we're going to be moving. It has, it has been crazy, and it's going to get a little worse before it gets better. Just coordinating everything. We're updating some, you know, some things. So don't look like your grandma's kitchen. Uh, anyway, we're, I'm, I'm hoping to very soon get things back to normal, getting out two to three videos a week. So thank you for your patience. Thank you for understanding. I do greatly appreciate it. Now, with all that being said, let's get to today's story, shall we? This is something that happens to everyone. You get a call from an unknown number, and you're faced with a decision to either answer or ignore the ringing. Most of us would just ignore the call, but after a minute or two, your phone begins ringing again, and it's the same number. So, would you ignore the call again, or simply answer it? Sure, you could ignore it, but it starts to ring again, and again, and again. The calls are becoming so annoying, the insistent chime is blaring in your ears, so you finally decide to pick up the phone. My name is Danny. I'm a 28-year-old woman who works full-time at a coffee shop to pay off student loans while looking for a job where I could actually use my college degree. I live with my best friend, Emily, who's a year younger and happily shares a seat with me on the struggle bus called Life. Emily and I have known each other for over 15 years, practically sisters since we were in middle school. We've been through it all together, from college dorms to our own apartment. We were completely inseparable. A few months ago, Emily quit her secretary job at a nice law firm. The money was great, but she couldn't deal with her boss constantly hitting on her. After being unemployed for a while, she eventually got a job bartending at a local bar downtown. I work mornings, and she works night, so our work schedules are the complete opposite of each other. I'll be getting ready for work, and she'll be coming in after a couple of drinks, after her shift. I was a bit jealous of her ability to just go out after work. I feel like every paycheck was being poured into bills. I had to pick up the extra costs of things after Emily was unemployed, but she's my best friend, so I tried not to give it a second thought. Last week, everything was starting to catch up to me, and I was beginning to feel burned out. Not only did I oversleep, but I didn't realize that Emily wasn't home yet. Unfortunately, we ended up sharing my car. I frantically ran through our apartment looking for Emily, but she was nowhere to be seen. That's when I texted her, and after a couple of agonizing minutes, she finally texted me back with a sad eyes emoji and a sorry on my way. Again, I try not to be upset with her. If the situation was reversed, I was sure she would help me any way she can. After telling my manager how late I'd be, and after a quick scolding, Emily had finally returned. I can drive myself, you know, I said in the passenger seat of my own car. Emily looked at me through her sunglasses and grabbed my hand. Come on, Danny, don't be mad at me, she said in an overly cutesy tone. Let me take care of you, for once. I'll be running pretty late today because of inventory. Do you have time to pick me up, take me home, and go to work? I felt her hand squeeze mine. I have all the time. I'm off tonight, so we can finally hang out. It's been so long, she said. Wow, really? Can you afford a day off? The words came out a bit rude, but Emily didn't seem to notice. We were stopped at a red light, and she just looked towards me with an exaggerated sad face. 
Uh, that place barely pays anyway. I just want to hang out with you. Please? I couldn't help but laugh at her face. I squeezed her hand in mine and agreed to a night of hanging out. Despite being incredibly late, work turned out to be okay. All of my customers were incredibly sweet. The coffee orders were simple and inventory went very smooth. My day seemed to fly by and I was excited to go out with Emily like old times. Finally, the time came for me to clock out and Emily was actually on time to pick me up. As I hopped into the car, I asked her, So, where are we headed tonight? That's when I noticed that she was wearing shorts and a tank top, practically her pajamas. Her blonde hair was stuffed into a purple beanie, and she turned to me to give a meek smile. Her eyes were a bit red and puffy, and I asked if she was okay. As I buckled myself into my seat, she assured me that she had just barely slept. I'm sorry. I, I know it's really lame of me, but I'm really tired. Do you mind if we just stayed in for tonight? She said. Her words were a faint whisper. Uh, yeah, sure. Is everything okay? She tightened her grip on the steering wheel and shifted in her seat as if ice ran down her back. Yeah, I had a nightmare and couldn't go back to sleep, so I'm really tired. My excitement quickly turned to worry as I asked her what her nightmare was about, but she just changed the subject and began to plan out what to do for the rest of the night. Emily definitely knows which of my buttons to press, and so when she suggested watching one of my favorite movies and pizza, I was too quick to agree. So we quickly made our way to the apartment. As soon as we went through the door, I rushed into sweatpants and an oversized t-shirt. I was in the kitchen preparing some glasses of white wine when I called out to Emily to order some pizza. Uh, can we do it on your phone? She asked shyly. That threw me off a bit. Sure. What's wrong with your phone? I asked. It's out of battery, so it's on the charger, she replied. Of course, I didn't think anything of it, so I went ahead and ordered a large pepperoni pizza with stuffed crust, my weakness. I slumped onto the couch with wine in hand, waiting for our cheesy goodness to arrive before starting my favorite movie, The Hunger Games. I looked over towards Emily to see that she was curled up beside me, and she was shaking. You've been acting weird since picking me up. Is everything okay? My words seemed to jolt her back to her senses. She sat up and grabbed the TV remote. I'm fine, Danny. Let's turn on something for background noise. Pizza should be here soon, right? Before I could answer, I heard a noise. It took a moment until I realized that it was the light buzzing of a cell phone. I looked at Emily to see her face was as pale as a sheet. Her eyes were wide open, and I thought she was going to let out a scream before she quickly shot a shaky hand over her lips. The buzzing continued to call out to us from the direction of the dark hallway. I was about to ask her if that was her phone until her other hand was pressed over my mouth. It's nothing, okay? she whispered. Just ignore it, please. I had no idea what was going on, but there was obviously something wrong. I grabbed her wrist and she let out a yell. What's going on with you? I shouted. I tried to get up from my seat, but suddenly she wrapped her arms around my waist and pulled me down. It's fine. Please, just ignore it, she shouted. I was hit with waves of worry, frustration, and confusion. For a moment, I thought that she was on drugs or something, but I've known her for too long, and I didn't think that was very likely. I wasn't sure what to think, as I slowly sat down next to my trembling friend, listening to the low buzz of her phone. Eventually, it would stop, 
Then after a few seconds, it would begin buzzing again. Another buzz erupted right next to us, and Emily let out a short scream, honestly scaring the shit out of me, until I noticed that it was just my phone. I let out a sigh as I got up to walk towards the front door when I felt a tug at the back of my t-shirt. Emily was gripping my shirt as if she were a lost child. That's when I finally had enough and snapped at her. Emily, what in the hell is wrong with you? I screamed at her. Before I could let out a string of curse words, the buzzing erupted from the hallway again. Enough was enough, so I stomped towards the direction of the noise. Emily frantically tried to get me to stop, but I couldn't ignore the phone anymore. I made it to her bedroom door and opened it to find her cell phone shining a white light on top of her bed. I picked it up, and upon looking at the screen, I could see that the phone was completely cracked. The screen was completely white, with a spider web of black cracks across it. The only part that wasn't cracked was a small corner of the screen that showed a green phone symbol to accept the call. No, please! Emily wailed from the living room. I ignored her cries and pressed my thumb onto the screen, placing the phone onto my ear. I felt the sharp edges of the cracks on my ear, and I spoke. Hello? There was absolute silence, not just from the other line, but from the whole apartment. The quiet was deafening, and I called out again. Hello? Who's calling? Again, I was met with silence. I felt anger bubbling inside my chest. All of this bullshit over a stupid phone call. I was going to end the call, but the second I lifted the phone from my ear, a man's voice called out. The voice was deep and scratchy. Are you there? I didn't recognize the voice at all. Who is this? I asked. I could hear the sounds of movement, as if they were moving closer towards my ear. Come back, baby. You didn't have to do all of that. I can fix it. The voice whispered in a low but unsteady tone. What in the hell? I said out loud. Listen, I don't know who this is, but leave us alone. I was met with another long silence until my ear was filled with sobs. The crying wasn't from the man. They were cries of a little girl. Confused, I walked towards the living room to find Emily in a fetal position on the floor shaking. What in the world was going on? I crouched down beside her, dropping her phone to my side and shaking the ever-living shit out of her. I screamed out her name to shake her out of her trance to ask her who the hell was on the phone. I didn't realize that the girl's crying had stopped, and she spoke. Why? Why did you do it? The little girl was loud and clear beside us, like she was standing right there. I turned to the phone, and underneath the cracks on the screen was an image of a girl, probably a little over six years old, with dark brunette hair covering her face. The girl's face twisted and shifted into an image of a middle-aged woman whose face was pale with splotches of deep purple bruises. Get back here, you little bitch, the woman on the screen said with a low snarl. How dare you? Emily let out a scream that pierced my ears, but I couldn't break my attention away from the phone. The face on the screen began to morph again, this time a dark-skinned man with short black hair appeared. He looked towards me. His neck was contorted, and I saw fragments of sharp bone protruding from the bin. The man spoke. Baby. Just come here. We can fix all of this. As the words came out, 
black blood pours out of his mouth and broken throat. Emily was rocking back and forth on the floor, holding her face in her hands and screaming out, It's not my fault. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. The lights in our apartment begin to flicker, and the phone begin to release a myriad of distorted screams. The noise filled the air around us, louder and louder as the lights flashed on and off. The phone on the floor began to buzz again. The sound of its vibrations mixed with the screams made me feel nauseous. I pressed my hands against my ears in a pathetic attempt to block the noise. The lights began to stroll faster and faster, and as quickly as it began, the lights suddenly cut off. What followed was darkness and an eerie silence. I just sat there for a moment in the dark, trying to regain my bearings. My heart ached as it thumped within my chest. I could hear Emily, a sniveling mess, beside me. I reached out through the darkness, trying to find my friend. My hands finally touched something solid, but I knew it wasn't Emily. What I felt was so terribly cold that it burned the flesh on my hands. Whatever it was had gripped onto my hands, and I let out a cry from the pain. The phone's white light suddenly cut on, dimly illuminating the room. I saw that little girl from earlier was squeezing my hands. Behind the girl was a bruised woman and the broken neck man hovering over Emily. The girl looked to me with black sockets where her eyes should have been and spoke with a whimpering voice. Why? Why did she hurt us? The girl began to repeat her question over and over. Why did she hurt us? Why did she hurt us? All I could do was look at her helplessly and plead for her to let us go. Once again, the phone began to buzz and a white light around us began to turn into a deep red. I saw that deep red ooze of blood begin to pour out of the cracks of the phone. I couldn't fathom what I was seeing. Whatever was happening was too horrible for me to comprehend. I was overcome with fear, and I shouted towards Emily, What have you done? She responded to my cry with another high-pitched scream. The girl finally let go of my hands and walked towards the front door. She lifted a pale hand and touched the doorknob, and as soon as she did, everything was back to normal. Emily was still crying beside me. The room was completely back to what it was, and the phone was at my feet. I ran to my friend. I wanted to offer words of comfort, but what came out was just pure fear and confusion. What did you do? I shouted. She looked up at me with tears in her eyes, and said, He promised. He promised that he loved me. Emily slowly got up and said to me with a blank expression on her face, They all had to go. If they were gone, then he could take care of me, and only me. It took me a few seconds to realize that a noise was coming from the front door. A loud banging followed by a man's voice. Hello, we can hear you. Open the door. I slowly got up. My knees were weak, but I was able to force myself up. I reached the door to open it, and there in front of me were a couple of police officers. The officer lightly pushed me to the side and said in a demanding voice, Which one of you is Emily? I had no idea what was going on anymore. In fact, I didn't even know if anything was real until the other officer placed a hand on my shoulder. We'll have to bring both of them in for questioning anyway. 
the officers led us to their cars and sped off to the station. Everything came to light when I was set aside for questioning. They set me at a table in an interrogation room with pictures of a man and a woman and a little girl in front of me. The three of them looked so happy in the pictures. The reason why Emily was late that morning was because she wasn't at work. She had been at a man's house that night. The man in question was named Robert, and he was her previous employer. It turns out that Emily didn't quit her secretary job, but was let go because Robert's wife had caught wind of their relationship. I had no idea that she was so obsessed with him. Not only that, instead of working, she was going off to see him at night. This was all shocking news to me, but what the police said next completely shattered my world. Robert had told Emily that they couldn't see each other anymore, but she couldn't accept that. So, in the middle of the night, Emily had gotten into my car and drove to his house to confront him. Of course, there was an altercation outside of their home. So to avoid any further embarrassment, Robert convinced Emily to go into the house to talk it out with the wife and daughter present. There was an argument, and Robert, the scumbag, tried to convince not only Emily, but also his wife that he was innocent. Emily just snapped. She pushed Robert down, and he fell onto the fireplace and broke his neck. But she just didn't stop there. In a blind rage, she smashed his neck repeatedly onto the fireplace while the wife watched in horror. Then Emily set her sights on the wife, who she thought ruined her love, and beat her to death with her own hands. Then their little girl emerged from the room, and Emily, Emily just couldn't stop. I don't want to talk about what happened to their daughter, but I can tell you that none of them escaped Emily's onslaught. What really chills my spine is that afterwards, Emily had just cleaned herself up and left as if nothing happened. She murdered a family and picked me up from our home to take me to work. I have no way to explain her actions. I had no idea that she could do something so horrifying. I've known her for years, but despite all that happening, that night, the thing that truly terrifies me is that the true monster was next to me all along.